we'll go ahead and start. How's everyone doing today? Okay, it's the end of the day after lunch, so I can understand I'm a little sleep myself right now. Um, we're moving offices in my division, and so I was lifting boxes all yesterday, and I'm incredibly sore right now. So hopefully I'll be recovered by at least um, tonight. But I'm Francois Grayson. I'm the Assistant Director for the Utah Division of Securities. Who's heard of the Division of Securities? I know Fidelity is heard from your Division of Securities, but that's nice that we, we have some people. Usually when I ask that question, no one's ever heard of us. Um, we're one of 11 agencies with the Utah Department of Commerce. Our primary role and responsibility is to license and regulate all of the financial professionals in the state of Utah. And so not only do we regulate them, if there's any complaint against a licensee or even a person who's not licensed, but they're selling an investment, we'll also investigate that complaint. One of the reasons that we'll usually come to this conference is for a few reasons. Um, one, one of our mandates is to uh, make sure we're engaging in investor education and outreach. So we're a sponsor for the conference and we usually partner with them um, to come and speak to students and then also speak to te teachers personally, for instance, for their 401k so that no scammers are coming out after your money. Um, and we just enjoy our outreach initiatives in general. So before I get too far into our presentation, um, I'm going to invite up to the stage with me, Billy, AKA Sean, he's one of our examina um, examiners with a division of securities. But usually um, I mentioned, and I'll let him take over and not take too much of his time. We also speak with students. So I'm gonna let him tell you about our program. And I think you have to put this on so they can hear you on the, on the online. All right, thanks. I know some of you already come and uh, talk to us at our table, so thanks for that. But uh, yeah, one of the things we do, we do investor ed and outreach. And so uh, we do go to classes and uh, present. This is my get up. Uh, I don't dress like this normally. Sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> um, That's where you got it from. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so um, I go and I do a, a pitch. Um, a sales pitch for an imaginary uh, cryptocurrency. And I have the students listen for red flags during the presentation. And then we talk about those red flags afterwards. And we talk about investment scams. We also talk about some of the major cases that we've worked in the past. Um, some of the trends that we're seeing here in Utah and also nationwide. And then I answer any questions that they might have. I know the older kids, they tend to be more interested also in not just the scams that are going on, but also like as a career path and what type of college courses do you need to take or what type of uh, job industry or like direction do you need to be a regulator? So it's fun. Uh, the kids enjoy it. I always bring a big swag bag. So lots of goodies, uh, just in case. <laughs> um, but no, I've never had a bad class. Um, they've always been engaged and interested. So um, if you're interested, just let us know um, and we can make that happen. So thank you. And Sean has cards if anyone would like to get into contact with him. So now for the boring stuff, but I think still informative. Usually when I present to a group, um, we do have content that we would like to get through, but also I would much prefer any questions from you so that you, I can hear from what it is that you would like to know about the division. So what we'll do today is we'll, I'll give you a brief introduction of who we are, the division's mission, and then we go into some of the scams and securities fraud and what is a security. And we'll talk more about what I mean by that. I have a few videos for you of some example cases that we've talked about and also some of the commercials we've run um, for how we can um, best kind of target our message. And, and we'll, we'll go from there. I have you for, um, I think, 50 minutes. So this goes until 3.20. And so I'll be respectful of the time. Make sure we get out of here on time. All right. 
So really quickly, I mentioned that we're one of 11 agencies within the Division of Securities. We have four different sections. And again, our role is to make sure that we're regulating all the licensees within the state. So we, uh, of our four sections, we have our licensing section, we have our um, compliance section, which is once you are licensed in the state, our team, our compliance team goes out and um, audits financial firms and makes sure that they're following all of the securities laws in the state of Utah. Our enforcement side, we call that, that the wild, wild west. <laughs> That's usually where we get the most amount of our complaints and where and where we'll have most of our administrative actions and also criminal components. And then lastly, we have our investor education and outreach. Now, usually um, this is a little diagram just to kind of explain how we go through the life cycle of a complaint. Um, but really, I just want to go over three things. Usually when we get a complaint from a member of the public, they have three questions. One of the questions is, will I get my money back? Um, another question is, how long will this investigation take? And another question is whether or not I have to participate in the process. And the question, the answer to all of those questions is that it depends. Um, usually we will request restitution, meaning we'll, um, in any administrative action or a criminal case, we will order restitution or our um, commission will order restitution. But the question of whether or not restitution will come back to the person is entirely dependent on whether or not the scammer in that, in that instance has the funds to be able to pay. Um, there's two elements there. If they're in prison, then obviously they're not making money to be able to, to pay the funds back, but they will have to pay it back um, oh, once they get out of permission. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So how do you know if like you're scammed? How do you know who to contact? Like, is this Great question. Like, is this like businesses you're talking no. about or is this like people? So for like, the division? My friend got hacked in her like Facebook mm -hmm. account. Like, Great question. Me? So okay. under the Department of Commerce, those 11 different agencies, okay. our agency only deals with securities. And in this next slide, I'm going to okay. go over what I mean by a security. Okay. Um, so for instance, I'm going to put Patrick on the spot really quickly here. He's our communications management or manager for Doppel. And so he deals with all of the professional licensing. So think uh, nail technicians, physicians, things like that. Okay. We only deal with security, so investments. Um, okay. So if you, your broker dealer agent, um, your investment advisor. So if you were investing, and again, I'll go over what a security means, we would be the folks that would look at that particular complaint. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Sure. Um, you mentioned um, something like consumer fraud, meaning let's say you bought something and you didn't get whatever was advertised. That may be something like consumer protection. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? All right. Um, so one of the questions will be if they'll get their funds back. Another question may be how long will the investigation takes? And again, that depends um, in a very, I will call it efficient investigation. Maybe we can get that done in about six to nine months. Um, sometimes it may take longer with a criminal element to it. And then the last question is whether or not I have to participate in the process. And again, that depends. But typically, if there's some sort of administrative hearing or a criminal case, you will likely have to take the stand. But don't worry, we'll prepare you for that. And also, you're just getting up there telling your story. So you're, you're telling what were you told about the investment, um, what were you promised about the investment, and, and what were you looking for in return. So those are usually the questions that we'll get from a complaint. Any questions so far? All right, so really quickly, what is a security? Um, my di director, he always gets um, on me about this because it's a very legalese concept. But the reason I like to put this in and go over it is because most folks have in, the, in their mind what they think about as an investment. So I'm going to ask you, what are some things that you think about when you um, say investment or what I would like to invest in, maybe holding in my 401k account or my trust account or my personal investment account? Stocks, did I hear that? Stocks, yes. Bonds, okay, I'm gonna put you on, a sp on the spot. What is a stock? Me? Um, oh. what, what's your name? Oh. Kim. Kim, okay, Kim said a stock, which is right. That is an investment product. What is a stock? Right, so you just purchase it, you, you um, buy it from the company. Yes, so you are owning equity in that company. You are owner of that company. And maybe the particular stock you have gives you certain rights. Um, so maybe you have voting rights or maybe you get dividends or something along those lines. So that is a particular type of investment. Um, I heard another person say a bond. And what's your name? Uh -huh. April. April. Yeah. April said a bond. What is a bond? Well, there are a few types. Okay. But generally it's kind of like a loan to a company or a government. Mm -hmm. Nope, that's perfect. So it's just what you think about. When you go and get a loan from a bank, what do they charge you? 
interest. And so the same in, in what April's saying. So you are loaning your money to a company, uh, let's say Apple, and in return for that loan, you're going to get interest on the amount. That's why you're doing it. You're not just doing it out of the kindness of your heart. So the reason I like to go over what is it, an investment contract is because essentially the courts had to come up with a construct for things that may not be equity ownership in a company or may not be a loan to a company, but it's still an investment product. So I like to go over this analysis because the vast majority of the cases that we see at the division does not necessarily involve a stock or a bond, which is what people people commonly think about, or a mutual fund, or an ETF. It involves this analysis here. So let's go through this analysis. So the, the name of this um, Supreme Court case is SEC versus uh, W.J. Howey. And essentially, essentially, the court said, if you have these four elements of a, a, an investment transaction, you've created something called an investment contract, which we also deem to be a security. So that would put it within our jurisdiction. You asked earlier about the sort of things that we would investigate. It has to be within our jurisdiction. And so the thing that would put it within our jurisdiction is that it is a security. So an investment contract has to have these four elements. There has to be an investment of money, in a common enterprise with a reasonable expectation of profits and is based upon the efforts of others. So let's break that down really quickly. It can be an investment of money or potentially an investment of cryptocurrency. It just depends on the transaction, but we would say either or. Um, a common enterprise is just a fancy way of saying what is the business that we're generating the profit here? Um, and I'll have an example here in a second and we'll go through what this means with a reasonable expectation of profits. That means you have not donated this money, you've given it to this company because you want them to do something to generate a return on this. So you're not just donating the money there. And then lastly, this force el element, based upon the efforts of others. So what that means is that you are a passive investor. You've given your money to someone so that they will engage in the business. They're going to be the one that's generating the profit. You're not being paid. You're not making any decisions about how that money is going to be used um, to generate any sort of profit. You're just handing your money over to someone and trusting that they'll do what they said they were going to do. So once you have all four of these elements, it can't be one and not the other. It has to be all four of them. The Supreme Court has said you've created something called an investment contract, which we deem that to be a security. So I want you all to keep those four elements in your head because again, um, and I, I talked about this earlier, most of the complaints that we receive is not based on the common things you would think about as a stock or, or excuse me, as an investment. And a lot of that is because scammers know what we do. <laughs> they know that if they give you something that says a stock, what they're supposed to have in order for them to sell that, and they know they don't have it. So they, they may give you a document that doesn't say any of that stuff, but it fits within this construct. Mm -hmm. Is it still like a security, like a stock or bond in terms of its buyer beware transaction? Does it matter whether it's public or private in terms of what we're talking about? It does not matter if it's public or private. Um, I will say with this caveat, and then I'm gonna address what you said because that was actually a really a great point. Um, I had this question from another group and they said, well, you know, my stock gives me the right to maybe make a decision about the company through voting. And what I what I told her was that, look, all of these different investment products, they have different characteristics. And so for this particular one, this is not a this is not the same characteristics necessarily of, of um, an equity um, debt in, or a debt instrument. It's just for an investment contract analysis. So, no, it doesn't necessarily have the same characteristics, but it can be so pr publicly or privately. It just has to fit within those uh, four elements and you have to have all of them. Mm -hmm. so this is taking us to a far Later, okay. How do MLMs fall into this? I'm sorry? How do like multi-level marketing? Oh, multi-level marketing? Well, it has to meet these elements. So let's say um, in an MLM, maybe you do give someone money. What would be our common enterprise in your example? Well, let's say like Lula Row. Okay. Like you are just expected to do work. It's not to mm -hmm. hand over your so you wouldn't meet that fourth element is what you're saying. Um, so this person's getting paid to generate the offer in the business? Is, is in your example, would that be the case? Okay, so that's that's what we would do. We would go through, and in fact, each time when we receive a complaint, we go through this analysis, even if it says that it's a stock, because we're looking at the actual function of the deal, not just simply the form, not just simply what the legal lease says from the scammer. And so, in fact, if we're ever challenged on this from a jurisdictional standpoint, usually it's picking out one of these elements because you have to have all four. So maybe we'll be challenged on the element that, hey, no, this investor was a critical part of the business. They were getting paid for their 
business efforts or whatever the case may be. And so this would take it out of that analysis. Any other questions? Good, because we have a pop quiz coming up. You all are teachers, so you know about pop quizzes. So who is my volunteer that I will not volunteer? Hmm? Okay, April's gonna be our volunteer. All right, let's go through this first analysis. So example one, Dan gives Jill $10,000 to start XYZ company to build musical baby bottles. This was actually a real case that we had. Jill tells Dan he will receive a 10% return plus the return of his $10,000 investment. So we have some more information here. Dan does not work for XYZ or receive equity ownership stock. Is this a security? And we'll go through the analysis together, April. So our first part of our analysis to see if this is an investment contract. Uh, do we have an investment of money? Yep. What is our investment of money? $10,000. $10,000. Dan gives Jill $10,000. And what has he given him $10,000 to do? Um, to make baby bottles. Yes. So that would be our common enterprise piece. So we know we have our first two pieces here. $10,000 um, to XYZ company to build musical baby bottles. Next we have um, Jill tells Dan he will receive a 10% return. What is our 10% return? The reasonable expectation of profits, perfect. And then we have our last element here. Is it based upon the efforts of others? So, uh, what I, okay, so that's what I, I didn't know what I put in there to give that indication. Okay, so Dan does not work for XYZ or receive equity ownership. So we're saying this is not a stock. He doesn't own the company. He's just given an investment. He's expecting a 10% return and he's not the one that's generating that profit. So is this a security? It sounds like it to me too, April. I'm going to give you some cool swag. <laughs> you want to give us? Yeah. All right, April. <laughs> She's like, I want that one. All right. Um, let's try this next one. This one is a little bit more complex. I also didn't include some information, but the purpose of this example is just to work through the analysis. So for this one, well, first, do I have a volunteer? They're not going to make eye contact with me. Okay. Like your students, don't make eye contact with her. What's your name? Chris. Okay, Chris. Chris is going to help me tackle this one. All right, so Bill is an accountant, so we have some information there. Martha asks Bill to help her build, to help her build and start a new limited liability company that will resell Amazon products. Martha asks Bill for a $100,000 loan as seed money to, start, to help start the LLC. Bill will receive a salary from the company. So this is more information. He will receive a, sal a salary from the company for his accounting services, uh, will make managerial decisions about the company, and will also receive an LLC interest. Now, I left some information out here. After a year, Bill never provides accounting services. And this was also based on a true, st um, a true case that we had. He never gets paid and he never makes any managerial decisions for the LLC, but he does give the $100,000 loan to the LLC. Is this a security? So let's go through the analysis. Our first one, did we give an investment of money? Yes, money. Okay, and what was our amount that we invested? 100,000. I'm glad you all did not trip, get tripped up on the fact that the uh, scammer called it a loan because again, they, they know what we do but we did give over a certain amount of money. Let's go to our next piece in a common enterprise. Why did we give this $100,000 loan? So that they could have this business of reselling Amazon products, perfect. So that's our second element. Our third one with the reasonable expectation of profits. I don't think I put that in here. There is a salary and so mm -hmm. kind of a complexion of this too, but that, that could be a form of profit. I don't know if we okay. call it the traditional. Okay. So you, we're saying the salary may be a potential profit for him. Yeah. So okay. Working for it at first. All right. Well, what about this last piece here? Based upon the efforts of others. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Good analysis. Anyone else want to help out or add in their perspective? We were supposed to get a portion of the LLC, so we're supposed mm -hmm. to get a piece of the business. Yep. That may not be the kind of effort, but he didn't actually do any of the things they agreed to. 
That's the kicker there. And this, and to be fair, this is how I wrote it. I wanted to more work through the analysis than to give a right or wrong. That's exactly right. Um, because again, we're looking at function over form. So in this case, the scammer put in the contract, and there was a contract in this case, that Bill was going to engage in all these different services and they were he was going to receive a salary because the scammer knows that there's based upon the efforts of others. So if we have this investor who's actively engaged with producing the return from the business, we may take it outside of that investment contract analysis. But in this case, Bill never provided any of those services. So we're going to look at what was the actual function, not just just what was put in the document itself. Um, so he did actually invest and he ended up never providing any of these services. Uh, there was a rate of return that they actually put in the contract. I didn't put it in the, um, in the actual example here, but we deemed this to be a security based on, on all, all those elements. Thank you, sir. You'll also get because some cool swag. Work. Because he didn't work, so we're taking it out of that element. No, initially it was Correct. Mm -hmm. He wasn't receiving. The whole mm -hmm. first year he, didn't get he didn't get anything. Right. Mm -hmm. So he, he literally invested, didn't do anything that he told that the guy told him he was going to do for a year. And then just after a year, um, nothing occurred. Piece, okay. okay. All right. I mean, just for the first year, yeah. mm -hmm. Any questions about the security analysis? This is very important because this is more likely what you will see, even just you individually. Um, this is what you would want to teach your students if you're te teaching them about what we would consider an investment um, and what would be within our jurisdiction for them to complain to. All right, really quickly, I'll go through um, securities fraud. There's a lot of legalese up here, but I'll just go through the basics. Literally, securities fraud is when you make any untrue statement of a material fact. What is an untrue statement? I always lie. <laughs> it's a lie. <laughs> it's a fancy way of saying it's a lie. When we lie about anything that's material. Now, for you as an investor, what are some things that's important for you to know before you hand over your money? Return. Your return. What am I getting for um, giving you this money? Mm -hmm. What else? I'm sorry. Your fees, how much is this going to eat into my potential returns? Yep. Is it secure? Is it secure? How risky is it? Mm -hmm. Maturity date. Is there a maturity date? Maybe if it's some sort of bond, when do I get the principal back? Mm -hmm. What else? What about what the money's being used for? Now, is it important for you to know if the person who's taking your money is going to go and buy a Ferrari or go and buy the Apple stock that you told them, that they told you you buy? So that's what we mean by materiality. Have they made any an untrue statement or a lie at the time of solicitation? So when they were asking you for whatever the investment was, what did they tell you that money would be for? And what were the critical points that made you as the investor invest in the thing? So that's what we're looking at here. When we say securities fraud, it is, the, it is unlawful for any person in connection with the offer or sell or purchase of a security to directly or indirectly make any lie or untrue statement about a material fact or to omit to state a material fact. So what would be an omission, for instance? Um, so I, I used to be in the industry as well. There was something that we had to fill out. It was called a U5 um, and a U4. And so on those forms, we had to essentially affirmatively disclose any neg potential negatives about our background. So one of the things, for instance, that I had to disclose is whether or not I had a bankruptcy within the past several years or so. So that's something that if you were actually licensed, you would have affirmatively disclosed. And as the investor could have made the decision of whether or not they wanted to actually invest with you. So if you're not um, disclosing those material facts, you're omitting it. So you can actually get at securities fraud either by affirmatively making an untrue statement or omitting to make a material fact. So that's, there's a lot of legalese there, but that's the gist of what it is. Any questions on that? All right, so we had a case. It was, um, it's funny because when I've, I've been um, in Utah for I, I think about nine years now, and one of the first things that I seen when I was driving down 15 was this big building that said Sagus. Did anyone remember that building? It said S-A-Y-G-U-S. No, every time I say that, no one remembers Sagus. it. Sagus. Uh huh. Okay, so yeah, I saw it all the time. Yeah. I'm like, 
So well, this guy, <laughs> and, and it's the most interesting case. This, so we um, investigated him specifically related to that case. While he was on pretrial release for that case, this guy was actually still soliciting funds for a new scam, and it was something called Smarter, Smarter um, Smartphone Company. And so we were able to, to bust this guy by listening to some of his phone calls uh, while he was waiting to be released. And so he has not even be, been sentenced in that first initial case for Sagus. This is only for the second case. So he received 41 months in prison just because he decided to continue soliciting funds when he was forbidden to do that by the court. So that's that's a pretty recent one. So he's going to actually be going through his his first case while he's in prison for his second case. Unfortunately, Utah has a very bad rep rep um, what do you call it? Uh, reputation. reputation, yes, thank you, for fraud. And it's not, it's not just a thing that we say, per capita, we have a lot of fraud in this state. And so we were trying to figure out as a division, well, what can we do to address this? Um, how are folks being targeted here? You know, why are they being targeted? What sort of research are they doing before and after they're being targeted? That's what we wanted to find out, to figure out how we could best support that from a resource standpoint. Um, so one of the things we did was to, to um, engage marketing research, research. And we knew some feedback from our complaints. We knew sort of um, what people were being targeted and, and what sort of investments they were targeting. But this kind of confirmed it. And, and what it confirmed was that the, the highest investment fraud um, the sort of investment products rather that we were seeing was mostly in investment contracts um, in cryptocurrency more recently, and then real estate type flipping deals, and then some stocks and bonds and things like that. But the vast majority were uh, what I would consider private investments like an investment contract. And then also younger investors were also um, being targeted. Even though they didn't have the most amount of money, they were just more comfortable transacting online and using things like cryptocurrency or online platforms where maybe you can now invest 20 bucks and get half um, half a share of an equity. So in, in, in that same vein, what we decided to do was run a marketing campaign that some of you may or may not have seen. It's called the Scam-A-Lot campaign. Has anyone seen those uh, billboards or the commercials? No? Okay. Well, I have a couple of video clips for you all to watch here. Um, it was a really cheeky way of kind of getting people's attention to figure out who is the division and, and why are we here and how can you come to us for as a, research, as a resource. Um, so let me play one of the commercials here. I have a couple of them. Hopefully it'll work. And we'll come back to pig butchering. So this first one is Lady Lockhart. She's our custodian of catfishing. And I'm going to come back to pig butchering and what that is. All right, and then let me play this one more, one last one, and I'll go back to pig butchering. I'm starting to learn the cryptocurrency. You'll make some serious dough if you invest. So really cheeky, but they got people's attention. So let me go back here. Who has heard of pig butchery? Okay, all right. What is pig butchering? Uh, when someone, so, well, it happened to me like uh, oh. a few months ago. Okay. I actually took screenshots and put them up on my screen for my class, or on my screen, and showed them. And it happened, I texted, I screenshots my sister, and she's like, oh, John Oliver, and there's no John Oliver, just did a bit on this. So you're sending a link, and it happened to be. Oh, yeah, I saw that. So was, yeah. Mine was like uh, something, I think it was about a horse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some lady was like, uh, hey, vet, somebody, doctor, whatever, is my horse okay? I don't care about horses, but I'm like, this person cares about their horse. So I, was, I, had, I went back and forth a few texts with this person, and each time, like, that's weird. That's real weird. Okay, that's super weird. I didn't respond. It was mm -hmm. like, clearly like a problem. But yeah, she was trying to, like, to, or whoever it was, which is sad because it's like a double scam. Like, it's like a double thing, right? It's like the person texting me is also getting, sorry, 
maybe too much. No, please <laughs> share the story because I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I've never had anyone say that they knew it, let alone have been yeah, yeah. So potential victim. Like, I could probably pull them up and read it, but it was like, uh, it's so nice meeting someone new, don't you think so? It's really nice to like meet somebody. There's a lot of like, bad people in this world, but you're a good one. And like, thanks for reaching back out to me or whatever. I was like, yeah, no, no problem. And then another one was like, yeah, it's so, so uh, interesting how fates can align and people can meet, don't you think so? And that's when I was like, okay, no, this mm -hmm. is <laughs> the wrong numbers don't go like this far. So I didn't, but yeah, I showed my kids about it and talked to them about that and like showed them screenshots of like what to look for. Uh, so how long did it take? Was that the same message before they asked for money or did it never no, get there? No, I never got that far. Okay. Yeah, so I never, uh, the, I think the fourth text, the one that was like, when they were like, fates align, isn't that so interesting? I was like, all the red flags mm -hmm. were going up. I was like, this is not a real person. Like, this is not a wrong number text yeah. situation. Normally it's just like, oh, sorry, wrong number. Yeah, no, no problem. That is a fantastic example because that's exactly what pig butchering is. They will send a very innocuous, very innocent sounding text and the whole purpose is to get to solicit a response because you're like oh yeah you know jane you know i'm running late for breakfast or whatever you're like oh well this is the wrong number i want her to make sure she knows that so your automatic response is to reply to that and say oh you know wrong number this is jane but that's their whole point because they want to have a conversation with you so that they will eventually ask you for money and never went there with you, but that's generally how the conversations will go. Wow, that was just the perfect example. So they will try to build up the relationship and what you said, two elements there, that's exactly what it is. It can be an element of, um, it can be an elephant of catfishing. Some examples that I've seen of this, they've had a relationship or they think they're in a relationship over long distance and maybe they've had conversations for months before there's any asks for money. The whole point is to build up that relationship so that they can eventually then ask you for money. Usually the scam is some sort of cryptocurrency platform. So you're sending your money off to some fake cryptocurrency platform and you don't get the money again. We've seen some elements of this scam where maybe you do get a little bit of return so that they can kind of show you, oh no, there's legitimacy in this. And then they ask for more money and more money over time. But that's why it's called pig butchering. The idea is to essentially fatten up your prey before you butcher them and take all of their money. But that was the perfect example. That's exactly what we're seeing. So we found out about this from the FBI only about a year and a half ago. Okay. So it's very new. Um, the idea of the scam isn't new, but this idea of pig butchering, and you mentioned the victimhood of the per persons who are actually trying to scam you. So we found that this scam is mostly coming from overseas and the people that they are getting to um, be the scammer, essentially, they're actually human trafficking them. So they themselves are being victimized while they're victimizing you. Um, but yeah. Perfect example. Wow. <laughs> Any other examples? Now that he's given an example, maybe you've had some of these and you don't know. So that's why, because the newest text, like I got one saying, hey, long time, long time, yep. how are you doing? Didn't respond. Mm -hmm. That would be, that's, yep. okay. The whole point well, is to get you to respond. <laughs> <laughs> so that, um, I, I saw the video yeah, clip you talked about. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was too much to, to show in a public setting, but... Since he said it, if you can, check it out. It's really cool, and he does like a funny take on it, but it's the real thing. It's exactly what we're seeing. Huh. Any questions on that uh, before we move forward? Which one did you say you checked out? Do you know the name of it? I don't know the name of it offhand. Uh, so it's the comedian John Oliver. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the name of though. So yeah, don't, don't show it in your classroom. It's a show. <laughs> it has some beeps in it, but it's, it's, a real, it's yeah, true. Yeah, it's it's what pig butchering is, but it's funny. Yeah. I don't remember the name of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I get them all the time. And again, they're very innocent sounding, but the whole purpose is to engage in a conversation. You are brave for responding. We always tell folks, look, they know what they're doing. They are social engineers. You, if you think that you're going to be able to play with them a little bit, we always get people that say, oh yeah, I like to play with them. I'm like, no, they will talk you out of your money. This is their job. <laughs> Like, yeah, they're going to talk you out of your money. <laughs> I know, but now we kind of need to so that we can like have an, 
We can have an example. If you respond, then they target you more because they know mm -hmm. that it's a legitimate number. So and part of it is mm -hmm. stealing out is this a real person's number. Yep, that's true. When people sell your data, yep, that's true. Any questions about that before we move forward? All right, I have a couple more examples, and then I want to get into some red flags, and then we'll wrap up. I'm sure you all have heard of a Ponzi scheme. Yeah. Okay. What is a Ponzi scheme, April? Oh. Was that you that said that? <laughs> uh, My favorite student. No, it uh, it's a pyramid scheme, but there's not usually a legitimate business behind it. Yep. It's just investing into the pyramid to get paid off the top. It, that's exactly right. And most folks have heard about this, especially after the Bernie Madoff um, Ponzi. Most people know what this is. So I have a clip for that. One of our scam a lot, Sir Safeguard. Hey, we're, hey, we're friends. friends. This, this investment, investment will guarantee a 20% interest payout, payout every month risk-free. Risk <laughs> I've listened to this clip so much. Um, my husband and I, we were watching a baseball game last night and we have the MLB network and so they run the commercial sometimes and I heard this and I heard it, I was like man that sounds so so familiar and then I looked up and I saw it I was like that looks so familiar but I wasn't used to not seeing it on my computer it was the funniest thing I was like oh yeah <laughs> but yeah we've actually gotten a lot of um, we received a, an award for this campaign um, in the state of Utah because it's been one of the most highly watched um, campaign and viewership, meaning people have actually seen it. Now, whether or not we can get them to respond to it and understand the resources behind it is another thing. Um, so that may be another challenge, but at least folks are, are viewing it. They work, they work for them. All right. Has any, when yes. Do you, so like people around here, right? They mm -hmm. go to like, uh, where's it's the SEC, like, it's them. So mm -hmm. when is it like Utah versus like federal? So, so we actually, there's it's only a difference in terms of what the SEC license, but it's not a different in, difference in terms of what we regulate. We both do the same thing. Okay. So each state actually has a division of securities counterpart. Okay. Um, so the SEC is the Securities and Exchange Commission, for those who may not know that, and they're just our federal counterparts. They are the folks who are going to license um, investment advisor firms that have at least $100 million in assets under management. And we're more of the primary regulator for state covered investment advisors. So when they get shipped off mm -hmm. to Denver for two years, someone I know, um, then that's the federal government doing that? Or were you guys involved first? And then what do you mean when they get shipped off? Well, when they go to prison. Like the oh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so we're, so we're not a prosecutorial body, okay. um, but we will work as the case agent. So we will refer the case over to essentially any law enforcement who will accept it. Okay. Usually for the feds, and we do work with the DOJ very often, okay. Uh, we'll usually refer a case to them if there's multi-state actors, so lots of different states involved across jurisdictions, um, and then maybe if there's a little bit higher dollar figure. But we've also had federal cases where it was $250,000 and just one actor involved. Yeah. We have a re really good relationship with our prosecutors, so they'll usually take our cases because, I mean, we're, we're essentially done with the investigation at that point, and we've referred it to them for criminal action. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? All right, who has heard of affinity fraud? All right, what is, can, can I see those hands one more time? I don't wanna pick on the same people. All right, we'll go with you. What is affinity fraud? Oh, uh, the most common type, someone that's part of the same family or group you are and never been you off. Yep, that's exactly what it is. Scammers essentially targets a readily identifiable group. This can be based on race, religion, your professional organization. They're either a real member of that group or they are a pretend member of that group. But the whole purpose is for them to be a part of that group so that they can gain your trust and maybe you won't ask as many questions as you typically would a stranger or someone who doesn't identify in the same group as you. Unfortunately, a lot of the cases that we see with the division, we talk about we talked about all these different elements of maybe there's some elements of Ponzi schemes or affinity or, um, or catfishing. 
a lot of our cases in Utah have this element of affinity fraud, um, specifically based on religion, the LDS church um, here. And as a result, we've actually been responsive to this um, from receiving so many complaints by um, starting a newer initiative where we're specifically targeting um, not just the, uh, the LDS community, but religious faith-based organizations in the state of Utah. And we've had a pretty good response where we're going out and specifically um, talking about what is, it, what is affinity fraud and how do you protect yourself from it? So I'm not going to play this full clip, but this is one of the worst instances, in my opinion, that I've seen of this. This was not in the state of Utah. It was one of our sister agencies in Colorado. But this guy is a pastor. Him and his wife were both um, charged in Colorado for securities fraud against their um, congregation. After they were charged, this guy uploads a video confessing everything that he's done. I'm not sure why he would do this. Um, but I'm, it, and we knew that it was going to be taken down. So I recorded it when we watched it and sure enough, within the hour it was taken down. So I'll, pl I'll play a little bit of this and then we'll move forward. Hello, we're Hello, next point, point day. day. We love you here. here. And I know yeah, it's been a long, long time, time since and there's a public, public update. update. All of our updates, updates are actually, actually being posted currently, currently on, on the utility section. section. Of, of the community. community. So if you don't, if you have, don't access have access to that, to that please leave me email, email me at eliindexpoint.com. We're reserving, we're reserving that, that for people, for people who, who have, have purchased it. Index index so this, so this update, update is, is to really, really just take, take, take some things head on. I'm reading from the script, I didn't prepare it, it's something I can normally do. do. And I was asking the Lord, what he wanted me to say, he said, just let me speak to you. So, so let me just let me come just out come first and foremost, and foremost, and foremost, and foremost by, by saying that, that Caitlin, Caitlin and I are being charged, charged in a civil charge, charge uh, from, uh, the from the Colorado, Colorado Securities Exchange, Exchange Commission for basically, for basically selling millions of dollars, dollars worth of cryptocurrency that is deemed worthless, worthless by the state. state. Now, the reason, now, the reason that, that they're saying that it's worthless is because there is no exit for people who have bought. So everyone who's watching, watching this, this, who has put money, money into this, this who, who wanted, wanted to take, to take money, money out, out, you've been you've unable, unable to, do to do that. that. We launched an exchange, exchange, the exchange technology failed, failed things went downhill, and, and from that, from that point, point forward, we've we just been, been, we just been waiting, waiting for the Lord, literally, literally for a miracle. So, so the charges, the charges are, are that Kate and I pocketed $1.3 million, so I just want to come out and say that those charges are true. So there's been one point nine million dollars that's been taken out. I don't think it's been taken out of three point four million. But out of that one point three, half a million dollars went to the IRS, and then a few hundred thousand dollars went to the home remodel that the board board just did. Yeah. So I'll stop it there, just for the sake of time. So, so it was really interesting. When you read the comments, and the comments aren't on the video, but he uploaded this to his platform um, publicly. And so you had some people that were members of his congregation that were, you know, responding affirmatively and like, I appreciate you, you know, coming forward and, you know, the Lord forgives and we're glad that you're bringing this forward. And, you know, whatever, I'm not, whatever you believe God told you at the end of the day, you did break the law. And so from his perspective, um, you know, whether or not he feels as though God was telling him to move forward with this, his congregants believe that. And they were in a very vulnerable position because he's in a position of power and they believe what he was telling them. And so a lot of the cases that we have, it will have an element like this, nothing this overt where we actually have the person upload uh, their confession before they're prosecuted. Um, I'm sure his attorney was having a field day, um, but this is essentially what we see in our cases. It is this overt. Um, and so unfortunately we've seen a lot of these cases in Utah. And so we're trying to address that specifically and say, look, just because this is mom or dad or your friends or your family, there is no family and friends exemption for securities laws in the state of Utah. So even if mom and dad are raising money, you have to go through the proper channels to be able to do that. So in our last minute here, I wanna leave you with just a few other pieces here. And I'll go rapid fire just so I can get you all out on time. Um, sometimes we'll get questions of, you know, what sort of questions should I ask my financial professional? So I've kind of boiled it down to about four questions that I think are pretty pivotal. Um, it may not get all the information, but it'll get some initial good information. So what would you ask? Um, are you licensed to sell securities? These are questions that you can find out online. There is a website called FINRA Broker Check, where it essentially shows, I'll say, the resume of a financial professional. And you can see any of their disclosures and any of their past 
um, history of who they've worked with, you can also call the division and we will tell you if we have an administrative action or if this per person is licensed to do what they're doing. You wanna know, are they compensated? That was one question or one piece that you brought up for what would be material for you as an investor. Um, is there an incentive for you to sell this product? An investment advisor has what's called a fiduciary responsibility. They have a fiduciary duty to make sure they are acting in your best interests as the investor. So uh, when you have those conversations about suitability and why you're investing, that is what they should be guiding you based on, not how much they're going to get paid. Um, and then lastly, what disclosures can you provide? They are, provide, they are required to provide something called an ADV, which again has kind of their resume, I will say, uh, what their investment philosophy is and um, any disclosures that they have. And then lastly, red flags. A lot of these are common sense, but again, a lot of the complaints we receive, people do not engage in these very basic um, considerations. Any high pressure sales tactics, any verbal investment agreements in and of themselves are not fraudulent. A lot of the cases we've had, there was no physical document, but maybe it met within those four um, analysis that we went over earlier for the investment contract. Paying for the investment in cash, no disclosure documents, um, guaranteed returns, higher or double digit returns with low risk. They go hand in hand. You can't have one without the other. Sending your investment to your financial professional. Yes, we've had that to their personal bank account. We've literally had several cases where that was the case. Um, and then lastly, no specific discussion of commissions or payments for investment services. But that's all I have. I appreciate you all's engagement today. Um, I can make this presentation available um, through um, for the summit for anyone who may like it, or I can just send it to you personally if you want it. There's a lot of good uh, resources in here, but thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.